Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, everyone, on the live feed. Um, a big thank you for BNH for having me here once again. Uh, I was here not so long ago, not even a year ago, um, on a different topic. But, um, and, and thanks for Leica for sponsoring this, this event. It's great to be back. And today's talk is going to be specifically about my project on Venice Beach, which you might have seen online a little bit yet already. And um, it started about three years ago as a casual street photography project, as probably many of you do street photography. This is, I was really just doing street photography around LA. And now it's culminating in a way that I would not have anticipated when the project started, uh, which is as a book. And it's published by a top tier publisher that I'll talk more about. So i um, very happy about this. First, I want to make an exciting announcement. As of a couple hours ago, literally a couple hours ago, I just launched a Kickstarter for the book, uh, for the pre-orders of the book. So I'll talk more about this at the end of the presentation. But just so you know, it's live. And um, there's, there's oh, something not working? OK, no worries. So anyway, we'll talk more about this at the end. So I spent most of my career in high tech. Uh, and gradually transitioned to going full, full time with my street with my photography only about a couple years ago. So you know, three three years ago really when, is when I went full time. And if you want to hear more about the journey that I took, because I know some of you have kind of similar um, uh, stories, uh, you can check my talk from last year, which is the evolution of a street photographer, and you can find it on YouTube. But today, let's talk about the Venice Project and. Um, when I started dedicating most of my time to photography, I started by doing a lot of street photography around Los Angeles, my hometown. So each day, it was pretty exciting. I, I would decide on which neighborhood I wanted to photograph, you know, which is kind of like New York, where you have a lot of different neighborhoods that have different vibes. LA, I would say, you know, maybe even more so with you know, completely opposites uh, that you can find within a few miles from each other. Between Beverly Hills and Hollywood Boulevard, downtown, Boyle Heights, Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach. This picture is from downtown. And I each day I would decide, OK, I feel like going you know, to this place. And so this is from Beverly Hills. Um, and it was very thrilling. It was you know, the kind of very freeing uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, feeling to, to, to decide on the day and just go and shoot and see what I came up with. And, well, it was very exciting. What I realized is after a couple of year, a year or two of doing this is that my portfolio was really all over the place. You can see the, the very different styles between the pictures, no consistency in the theme. And Venice Beach, really, the other thing I, I realized is Venice Beach was really where my, where my heart was. Uh, that, that's the project that really gave me or the, the place that gave me the most satisfaction. There was no project really yet at the time. Um, if you, any of you have been to LA and have visited Venice Beach, it has a very different feel from um, a lot of the other areas in LA. It's very free spirited, very anti materialistic, very inclusive. And I, feel, I felt like I connected that better than some other areas of LA, that, you know, so, uh, which I shot also. This is from Beverly Hills as well. But there's a lot of materialism, a lot of consumerism, you know, the fashion, the cult of personality, the star system. The, I didn't quite connect with that as well as much. So the fact that I decided to focus on this particular project, I want to just kind of back up a little bit and raise a couple of what I think are important points for street photographers to consider. Um, one is why work on specific projects. I was you know, perfectly happy to work on you know, just shooting all over LA without a project in mind initially. Why did I choose on a specific project? And then the second question that I want to raise uh, for street photographers is how to choose a good project. What is a good project? Because I believe it's different for everyone. But what is the criteria to find a good project? So first, why work on a specific project? Uh, and I want to put, again, I want to have a disclaimer here that there's nothing wrong with not having a specific project. I think many people do that, and maybe many people do that very successfully. I'm just talking about my own experience. One is I found it easier to get published and to have a coherent body of work that I could present for <laughs> blog features and exhibits and even for a book. The second thing is I thought 
I realized that shooting with intention, with the intention of, of, of um, completing a specific project, made me a better photographer because I started seeing myself more as a storyteller as opposed to uh, kind of a hunter of you know, one image after another without really a link between the images. How, so, which brings the, the topic of how, how to choose a good project. And for this, I'm going a little bit in my business background. Um, and coming from the business world, I decided to kind of borrow from a book um, from the 90s that uh, Jim Collins uh, wrote called Good to Great. And in this book, Jim described a concept of how great companies consistently make great decisions. And I've been using this in my professional life uh, before photography. I used it also in my personal life. And I feel like it really applies to photography. So I'm going to share it with you today in the context of photography. And I believe a, a good project is at the intersection of three things. Um, so first is what you love shooting. You know, if, I think it's important to choose something you really are passionate about. That seems like a no-brainer, right? The second thing is something that you're I ideally positioned to do, something that you are, you, you have an ad like so almost like an unfair advantage over other photographers. Uh, you are ideally positioned either because you you know you're in the right location, uh, you have the right access to a certain situation, you're familiar with a certain culture. It could be the language. It could be all those different things that make you ideally positioned to shoot that project with a very personal uh, vibe to it. And the third thing, it's important to have a public for for your work or it might be important to you to have a public. So you have to be conscious of who's your target audience. And it can't be just you if you want to public publish the work. I mean, it can be, unless you, but, but if you do want to publish it and you want anybody to care, you want to be aware of who your audience is. Does the style that you're shooting fit that audience? And you want to look at how much similar work has been, been done and everything. So you, the project is at, obviously at the intersection of all that. Um, in the case of Venice Beach, for me, just to bring it back to this project, it was ideal because I really loved, I, I felt compelled to shoot there. This is really kind of where I ended up out of love for the place. I live 20 minutes away, so it was very easy for me to get there on a daily basis. And, um, and it fits my style. I connect with the people there and so on. So I was really, I feel like, ideally positioned to shoot there. Um, and it's a... Uh, it's a huge tourist destination. It's iconic. Even people who haven't been there kind of know it just from um, the, the history and the culture. So, um, and then very few people, even though a lot of people have shot there, there's very few book that exists. And I, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. So I think it's worth putting some thought into deciding this if, if you're going to shoot a project. Because if you're going to do it, chances are you're going to be shooting it for over a year. And it's something you're going to be shooting often. And you know, you're, you're going to be miserable if you don't really love doing it. So it's, um, I think for the, to stick with it for the long run, it really has to be something that, um, that, that you love doing it, you're well positioned to do. So shortly after deciding about this project, when I really shifted from just the general street photography to shooting this Venice Beach project, that's right around the time when I was accepted in a, in a couple of very good uh, photojournalism workshops that I did. And I talked about that in my previous talk. They really made me see Venice Beach more as a culture to document, as opposed to just a, sing a series of single photos that I was taking. So it really changed how I viewed my, my project. And I also did a, a class at the Santa Monica College for photojournalism. So this whole photojournalism angle helped me see the, the, the place in a different angle. So at that point, I really went into more depth. And um, one of the things I had to unlearn from street photography is, I don't know if I'm assuming a lot of, some of you are street photographers. W one of the first things they teach you in street photography school or <laughs> on blogs and so on is, how to not make contact with your subjects and how to be invisible and try to kind of steal the images but without people noticing that you're taking them and so on. And to go deep into the culture of, of Venice Beach and, and get really close to the characters there and everything, show it from, to show it from the inside really, 
I had to unlearn that and really engage with the subjects and, and immerse myself into the, the culture. So I spent a lot of time just hanging out on the boardwalk, uh, got to know a lot of the people, their struggles and so on. I became friends with some of the homeless people there and I would you know, hang out with them and just chat and you know, not always photograph, just you know, create real, real connections uh, with them. And the other thing I did is I started doing some heavy research work on the history of Venice, um, what books had been published before. And despite there being, there's about 10 million tourists a year in Venice, uh, Venice Beach alone. Uh, that's the number one tourist destination in LA. And it is number two in Southern California after only Disneyland. Uh, but despite that, there haven't been that many books published on Venice Beach, so that was very surprising to me. These are the four that I found, and the closest one to the work I'm doing now is, was published in, in 1985, um, so that's, and it's been out of print for a long, long time. Um, I also got more focused and methodical about the project, uh, started making shot lists. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of shot lists, but th it, it's very useful. It's just not a shopping list. It's really uh, you know, something to kind of get your brain going about what you'd like to shoot or to remember situations that you want to go back to. Uh, but in the end, if I look at my work now and I compare it to the shot list, I could say that most of the shots were not shots that I anticipated. And probably the better ones are not the ones I anticipated. But it was helpful to, to have that process uh, to, to get to them. Um, I also would come back more often, two, three, four times a week try to vary the weekdays and the hours to try to bump into different situations. Because um, a lot of crazy stuff happens that, in, on Venice Beach, which makes it very interesting. But it, you never know when it's going to happen. And it, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing too many of these things. Um, and I felt kind of guilty when I wasn't there, <laughs> thinking, oh, there's probably something happening right now, and I'm not there to shoot it. Um, and then the other thing is I added a lot of events to, m to, the, to my calendar. You know, I researched what, when the big events uh, were taking place and uh, try, to, try to be there for that. So um, the Neptune Parade, the bodybuilding contests, the festivals, and so on. Uh, that was very, uh, very helpful to do that. So after shooting that project for a while, um, I managed to collect enough good images that I was able to put together a solid portfolio of 20 to 25 images. Of course, I had a lot more than that uh, in total, but I really was able to kind of condense it to those 20, 25 images that I was proud to show. And the timing was great because that's just uh, at that point that my uh, friend and mentor, Aline Smithson, uh, recommended that I go to the Photo Lucida portfolio reviews. So Photo Lucida is a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with portfolio reviews. It's, I, I'll explain briefly what, what, it's, what it is. But th this particular one is held in Portland every other year. So the f next one is in 2019. The one I went to is the one that, that was this year uh, in April. And arguably, it's the best photo portfolio review for, any, for fine art photographers and a little bit of documentary photographers. And since my work is kind of at the you know, in between fine art and street and, and documentary, that was really a, a good uh, event for me. And obviously, there's a lot of other portfolio reviews um, around the country. And there's actually one going on right now uh, at the Photo Plus um, in a couple blocks from here. So, and actually, I, I brought um, for th for those who want to see that later, I brought uh, some prints that I'm going to show at. Uh, Photo Plus, so just so you see what, <laughs> how, how the work is presented. But for, for those who haven't attended portfolio reviews, it's basically like speed dating is the, the easiest way to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to explain it. You, there's a lot of different tables, and you meet for about 20 minutes, not about, you, exactly 20 minutes at a time with people like magazine editors, book publishers, gallery owners, museum curators, and you're able to meet with people that would normally not give you the time of day. It's, that's, it's really a fantastic opportunity for those who can go um, to meet with you know, the people that you, if you sent a cold email or cold, if you've made a 
cold call, you, you could never connect with them. Um, but there they are, they're all there. And uh, so I was able to meet with 20 reviewers over the course of four days. So it's, and it's not just the 20 minutes, because you have to know who they are, so you have to do the research on all of them and, and really get to know who they are so you can present you know, for that person. Um, so so that, was, that was amazing, ama amazing experience. The downside of portfolio reviews is that they're, they tend to be expensive because you're paying to go there, uh, and then you, you're paying for a hotel and airfare if it's not in your town. So it's, it, can, it can get expensive. So you really want to be ready, and you want to be prepared, and you want to have a portfolio that's strong enough, that, um, and, and you want to have it on the specific project or topic that, that you're showing. Uh, you really want that focus. Um, the other thing you need is to have a specific goal because they'll ask you, the reviewers will ask you, why are, you know, what do you need from me? Why, why are you presenting your work? And they, they're trying to tailor their feedback to what your situation is. They, they won't give you the same feedback if you say um, that you're just um, you know, middle of your project and you're trying to, you, know, you, you're get, you want to get some feedback on where to go from there, whereas you, know, you, you might get a different um, answer if you say that you... Um, your project is finished and you're looking to get it published. So they, they, they try to help you, but they need to know where you want to get to this, to what direction you're going. So when the portfolio review was over. So did you tell them you wanted to publish a book? I, I told them exactly. So I was there with my 25 images and I said, I'm looking to publish a book and I'm trying to get smarter about finding a publisher and so on. So when. Um, when, it's over, when the portfolio review was over, I had um, received a lot of feedback from, from my work, um, you know, from all those reviewers, uh, which was really great. Sometimes the feedback was contradictory, though, so that was interesting to try to parse through all of it. Um, I had met a lot of peers there that I had learned a lot from, and I had seen their work, and that was very enriching. And I ha even had some uh, blog article commitments, so that's, that was, that's what was uh, scrolling on the screen, I think earlier, let's see if we can do that again. So that was one of the blog articles that was published after the review. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but the most important thing that happened is that I met uh, a publisher named Kara Verlag, who's a, a top tier German publisher who expressed interest in publishing the book, the, uh, the photo book. So that was um, quite thrilling. I wouldn't say that they gave me the contract after the 20 minutes, but they, you know, they, they asked for a uh, PDF of more, you know, they wanted to see more. They wanted to see how much depth there was to the project, if I had other images I could show. And they wanted to see an additional 40 to 50 images, which is, you know, it's challenging to get, to get them. So I, I sent them what I had at the time, which was s strong, but I felt like it could still be stronger. So they, they actually were okay uh, making the book right there and then uh, after I sent, well, not after the review, but after I sent them the PDF and we discussed that a little bit by email. Uh, but I felt like there was an opportunity to, um, to, to, to deepen the work a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But Kerr was someone, you know, was a publisher that was really, um, I, I, I was very uh, excited about talking to because they had published some of my favorite books. Uh, you can see here from uh, Bruce Gilden and Martin Parr and uh, the Leica book that um, came out a couple years ago, Eyes Wide Open, um, it, they also published that. So anyway, the, the great, great books. So, Did you get any bites from anyone else? Um, I, I, I'll answer the question, that, but keep, keep the question for the end. I'll, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, so, and, and I, I did meet with other publishers, and uh, it, it was really interesting to get everybody's feedback there. So. I asked them if I could continue to shoot through the summer. I said, you know, I'll, I'll get you the edit. Instead of getting you this edit now, I'll get it to you in September. I want to shoot through the summer because that's really the peak activity for, for Venice. You know, that's when really everything happens. And uh, I, wanted to, I also wanted to make sure I, I was doing a comprehensive job at, at representing that culture. And I felt like I had some areas that I could go deeper into. So one of the things I did at that point, right before the summer, was uh, to hire Gail Fisher, who uh, used to be a senior photo editor at National Geographic and the LA Times for all her career. She's now freelance. And she agreed to work with me on uh, first uh, editing the work the way I had it 
before the summer to identify any gaps and see what, you know, what photos we would really want to keep for the book. And, and then uh, I, I was planning on working with her as well later down the road to edit and sequence the final version of the book. So that was a great partnership that started at that point. And she helped me throughout the summer. We met on a regular basis to review my shoots. And I was able to, uh, to fill some of the gaps that we were, we were um, identifying. One of the gaps that she brought up is that I had, didn't have any photos about the police or police activity on Venice Beach, which was, you know, it was an important aspect to document. And the reason I didn't have it is it was a tricky thing to document. It wasn't all black and white, no pun intended. It was really complex because the cops had a challenging job on the boardwalk and they were pretty good at a, their kind of a soft approach to community policing. There were excesses sometimes, but they especially happened when they were bringing in new cops from outside uh, the neighborhood. So it was a tricky thing to represent. And so you, you see in those photos that I, I'm showing right now, those are the ways that I kind of found to um, represent the the duality of this, this situation uh, and try to find those candid moments that happened kind of in the wild uh, it, but represented um, what was happening there and, and try, try to do a good job at, at the good cup, bad cup situation. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that those, those are some of the photos I showed, uh, shot over the summer. And so shooting often and very deliberately looking for certain types of topics uh, I was able to produce a lot of additional images for the book to really strengthen that edit. I'm going to go through a few of them here. I love the, the eyes. I just don't know how he's standing up on that skateboard, and never mind holding that dog. <laughs> and the dog is like scared to death. <laughs> so just crazy moments that happened, and you kind of have to be there to get them. He's a character. He's been there since 1972, every day on the boardwalk. <laughs> Even some candid moments with dogs. Um, so now might be a good time for me to share some of the lessons I've learned uh, while shooting this project and, and just along this whole path of mine. I think it will be uh, hopefully be useful and relevant to you guys. So a while ago, when I started shooting street, I realized that often I'd come back from a shoot, and I thought I got the shot. But when I looked on the computer, I really didn't. Or it was close, but not quite. And I don't know if that sounds familiar to a lot of you guys. Um, so I'm kinda, I've kind of set a rule for myself that I felt like I, you know, maybe be, might be help, helpful to share. My, uh, the rule that I follow now is that I shoot either until a scene disappears, it's no longer there, uh, or I get kicked out. <laughs> that's, my, that's my rule. Either it's, it's gone. If it's a good scene, I'm going to stick with it until it's gone or I get kicked out. So in, in this case, I didn't get kicked out, but, um, but the, the guys finished their workout. So they went home. And I, but it, it was useful to shoot it for that long because it took me about maybe half an hour into the shoot to realize, well, first of all, there was only one guy at first. The second guy came maybe 20 minutes in. And at some point, I realized that there was Arnold Schwarzenegger with the, the mural in the background. And I could get him in from that angle. But I had to go low. And so that, that whole thought process and everything, I mean, it was great that it was a long work, workout session. And I kind of stuck with it and tried a lot of different things. So you know, working a scene for a long time doesn't mean you know, staying in front of it, pressing the shutter, and you know, spraying and praying, as, as they say. Uh, it really meant really being patient and alert and anticipating moments and trying different angles. And, and that's the fun of it, really. It's like trying to get creative, you know, especially if a scene lasts like this, where it's some kind of workout session or something. It's an you know, amazing opportunity to really work all the angles. In this case, I was in the back at first, and then I realized, well, Shooting it from the other side would be much more interesting because I could get all the faces. And then if I got low, I could you know, get that shadow and so on. So anyway, it's, the thought process really happens as, as you shoot and you kind of move around and everything. Another rule that, that <laughs> works for me is this is not my photo, by the way. But it's not me on there either, um, is, is simplifying my gear. 
Um, what you see here is basically my kit, uh, and I'll show that on this slide. But the, the reason why um, less gear works for me is, and I'm sorry to be saying this at BNH of all places, um, <laughs> but um, it, there's only so many decisions I can make before the moment is gone. And as you've probably noticed, a lot of my images are about the moment. And so those precious microseconds that happen before the moment is gone, I'd rather be spending them on decisions like where to stand and how to frame the scene and you know, where to set my focus, as opposed to which camera or which lens or tripod or filter to use. So that's, that's really why you know, this really filters it down to the bare minimum. And this is, uh, so this is what I carry with me. And in fact, <laughs> in this bag, usually I have uh, this and a windbreaker. That's, that's, that's all I, I, could, I could use a small bag, but the windbreaker is nice uh, on, on, on cold evenings. <laughs> so, um, so it's very freeing, and I, I encourage you guys if you don't, you know, if, you, if you have a lot of gear, to just go out with one lens, one camera, and see how that feels. So this is a 35 millimeter um, uh, prime lens. Um, and so what we'll talk about while we're talking about gear, I want to the one thing I noticed, um, and I don't know if you've noticed the same thing going on on forums and, and discussions online, is that there's sort of an obsession about the specs. You know, it's no longer megapixels, now it's dynamic range and ISO and all these things, um, which totally makes sense. I get it for f commercial photographers or people who shoot fashion um, or very precise portraiture that needs to be reproduced uh, very big. But for street photographers, specs really have very little to do with producing great images. So this is uh, an image from uh, Bruce Davidson in the 50s. And if you look at it, it's super grainy. I don't know if you can see it here, but if you saw the print you know, in the book, it's very grainy. Uh, it's not quite sharp. I think the focus was probably slightly ahead of the subject, so it's not, the focus is not precise. But you know, at, this, at the time, it was manual focus, and the guy was running, and it was hard. The highlights are completely blown up there, so talking about dynamic range. Uh, but in the end, who cares? It's a well-composed, it's, 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 it's full of soul, and it's a great image that's part of an important body of work. Uh, it's part of a, it's a, in a book called Circus. Uh, that's this great book by, by Bruce Davidson I, that came out actually fairly recently. And this is another image from the same book, and this is even grainier. <laughs> uh, so talk about ISO. And um, so, so what, what really makes, you know, brings the point of what makes great images. And we were talking about that early, earlier before the talk, right? So I, my opinion is really seeing in your own personal way. That's really what makes great, great images. And that's what Bruce Davidson shows in those photos. And the best gear, in my opinion, all, all the best gear can do is really get out of the way so we can focus on seeing and our, our way of seeing. So learning to see is a good segue, actually, into the next topic, which is what am I looking for? What makes a great street photograph, or what makes a great, great documentary photograph? And while there's no real recipe for that, and there's always exceptions, I found something which I mentioned in my last talk, but I thought was worth revisiting here. Uh, it's a sort of a formula, a recipe, that my friend uh, and uh, fellow street photographer, Craig Sumetko, uh, taught me once. And it's an acronym that helps me remember the ingredients of what goes into a great photograph. And the acronym is D-I-E. And it stands for design, information, and emotion. And it helps me decide what to shoot. When I, when I come across a scene, I'm thinking about, you know, can I design properly? Can I represent what's going on? And can I get, is there an emotion there? And I'll go more into that. Uh, and it helps me edit my work also. When I come back from a shoot, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see if my photos have those elements in them. And by design, what I mean is composition, layering, foreground, middle ground, background, light, you know, all these things are part of design. Information, um, information is tricky. So design is something we learn you know, very quickly. If you do you know, some reading on photography, I think that's kind of the first thing we learn, how to, you know, the rule of thirds and things like that. It's very formulaic, and, and of course, you can break the rules, but you have to learn the rules because, before you can break them. But uh, information is trickier because as a photographer, you're in the scene, and you're seeing it in a three-dimensional way, and there's sounds, 
and there's, there might be smells, you know what's happening before, you know what, um, you, you see what happens after. So you have a context, a three-dimensional context that you're navigating in, but um, w you need to condense that into a two-dimensional frame that the viewer won't have any context about when they see it. So it's tricky to actually show what happened or at least give enough information to the viewer so they can imagine what happened when they see that two-dimensional picture. The third one is emotion, and the, it can be the emotion that's depicted in the image, so someone's face you know, it has a certain expression that depicts an emotion, or it could be an emotion that's triggered by the image, or it can be both, like, like in this case. So if you think about some of the most iconic images you know, that everybody knows, um, there are excellent examples of how emotion can make a photograph, but if you, if you notice here, D, I, and E, Design is, is absolutely fantastic. The information is very clear. And the, the emotion is incredible. And that's part of, you know, those things are part of what makes this image so iconic. Um, it really captured the, the mood of the, the Great Depression um, in a fantastic way. Same thing with this image that everybody knows. Neil Eifer nailed every aspect of, of design information and emotion. Right? You've got that triangle, uh, and the information is clear. There's no, no, uh, no confusing what, what, what's happening here. And then the emotion is uh, super, super strong. Now, if you think about where to shoot from, these guys in the background, they weren't so lucky, right? Because they couldn't get, they might be get, getting some design. Maybe they can figure a way to make this look interesting. But they definitely couldn't get the information or the emotion. So where you stand and you know, really, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very important here. Another one you know, that everybody knows, uh, Robert Frank really you know, nailed all three elements here. And it's amazing how he's able to tell the whole story in one frame, you know, with multiple emotions and expressions. And um, so, so anyway, again, design, information, emotion. So, and sometimes, so this is one of my favorite pictures uh, from uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, two of the three aspects can be strong enough that they compensate for the third. So in this case, you could tell that you know, arguably design, he broke almost every single rule of de design you can think of. Right? He cut the feet off, um, the boy is straight spank in the middle, uh, there's you know, even a character on the left that's cut off. You can only see an arm and a little bit of a skirt. Uh, there's, you know, the corner of the store is coming out of his head. I mean, you, you, there's many things that you could see as design flaws in this image, but the expression, the emotion is so strong and the information is conveyed, conveyed so well that it just makes up for the design. And it not just makes up, this is one of the most iconic images ever taken. So back to the project, in September, I worked closely with Gail, the editor, to produce the final sequence for the book. And that sequencing process was quite interesting. This was actually on my dining room table. I had uh, a lot of images that we just laid out there, and we tried to figure out what the sequence was. Some of them didn't make the final edit. We, you know, we shuffled it quite a few more times after this. So this is by no means what's in the book. But, that was the process, and that was a fascinating process to, to, to have this very tactile um, process with the, with the photos. So when we finished, we, we went through several revisions of that, including online just uh, sending uh, each other uh, edits back and forth. And at the end, we sent it to the publisher. The pub publisher really loved the, the edit that we came up with, but they also had some, a few tweaks to make, which make, that made the edit even more, more successful, I think, and, and stronger. And it was truly a collaborative effort that was amazing. So one example, just to make it more tangible for you, I was amazed how some of the pairings really work together. You know, there's some images that I had never thought of putting together. Uh, in the book, most images are actually not like this. They'll span mo to the two pages to, to see more of the details and everything. But in some cases, we thought the images were simple enough and paired each with each other well enough that we should really show them on op opposite pages. So, so these are a few of the examples of the pairings that we did um, 
And of course, the images have nothing to do with each other, but they really pair well together. Well, in this case, they do have something to do with each other. Just completely different subjects. It's just they just go well together. So my final edit um, has now been sh been shipped to uh, to Care of Erlag to the publisher, and. Um, I actually plan on being on press uh, in Germany when they print the book over the winter, so that, that will be uh, very exciting. I don't have to, but it should be exciting. And then if I want to make last-minute changes in terms of the paper or the ink or any of that, I'll be able to see things coming out of the press, so that will be quite an experience. I imagine the you know, presses from like, uh, the, you know, when they invented the... <laughs> that, that, that's what I imagine the whole process to be. I'm sure it's going to be exactly like that. Um, but anyway, the, the book should be out uh, in terms of the, the real launch over the summer, but the, the Kickstarter books will probably ship in the spring. That's really when the books will be uh, printed and everything, and I should get them here, I mean, in, in, in LA. So pre Kickstarter books ship in the spring, the, the uh, store launch probably over the summer. I was amazed by how many decisions go into making a book, like the whole design of the book thing. When you pick up a book and you flip through it, um, I, you take a lot of things for granted, but so many decisions have to be made in terms of the cover, uh, what orientation you want the book, landscape, portrait, um, square, uh, size of the book, the type of paper you use, the layout of the images, how they, how they fit in those pages, the captions, where do you put the captions, uh, and, and a ton of other details. So what I did, I mean, I, I was kind of lost because this, this is my first book. So the, the way I went about this is I, I actually have a decent collection of photo books. I went and looked for the ones I love the most. That, not just that I love the photo book, but I, I like the way it's laid out and the design of it. So these are two of the books that I um, emulated the most uh, and borrowed the most from in terms of uh, layout and design and everything. Um, and um, another thing is, if, for, for those who follow me on Instagram, uh, you know that I tend to post very long captions. I like to give the background um, behind, uh, the, the story behind the images, really, because I feel like it really takes the image to another level and it helps you appreciate what the scene was about. So I plan on having, you know, I wrestled with that, because where do you put the caption? Uh, in a photo book, you don't want to distract from the photo, and you want the photo to really take a decent amount of room. Um, so a lot of, I think, what's mostly done, if you look at most photo books, is to have a caption section at the end. The problem with that is you end up going back and forth. You can't look at the image while looking at the caption. So we brainstormed uh, with Gail, with my, my editor, on how to solve that. And uh, I thought about a, probably one of my favorite books um, ever, which is an old book. Uh, the Decisive Moment by Cartier-Bresson, and, and what he did at the time I thought was very innovative, which is he, he did a caption booklet. So there was a booklet that came with the book, and you could take the booklet out, and that had the captions in it, so you could have both open at the same time. And so, um, and we, I think we improved on it, because we were going to have uh, little um, thumbnails of the images. So you don't even have to go back and forth. You could just use the caption booklet and just look at that. So that, that will be, uh, I think, a good, good way to resolve that, that problem. A lot of people have helped me and, and inspired me along the way of making this book, so I wanted to somehow include them in the book as well. Uh, my friend uh, and mentor, Jamie Rose, is writing the foreword for the book, and some of my favorite people in, from the photography world have accepted to write blurbs from the book. So uh, people like Ed Cashy from the Seven Photo Agency and Matt Stewart from Magnum um, and uh, Jim, Jim Wagner from Leica and, and so on will be, uh, will be writing uh, uh, blurb. So that does, uh, that's great to be able to include them that way. Uh, so now that I'm going into the promotion mode for the book, um, I, I really want to focus on that. It's, it, it's, a, it's a change because you, know, you, you go from shooting every day on the project and I haven't shot on, you know, in Venice for now about a month because I've been focusing on the promotion of that. And it feels weird you know, to make that transition. So. Uh, but according to the publisher, a lot of the many authors of photo books make the the mistake of kind of phoning in the the marketing of their book. They're kind of passing everything on to the publisher and saying, "Okay, you deal with it now." 
And um, you know, it's it's a big mistake in from from what I'm told from the publisher is that really the photographer is the best able to represent the work and really should be out there uh, representing the work. So I intend to do that, and uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Um, and I've spent a lot of time shooting this, so I really want it to be uh, you know to be shared and 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 seen out there. So. Backing up a little bit and figure, one, one thing we haven't talked about, you know, it was kind of a logical thing going from the shooting the project to making the book, but you might want to ask why, why make a book in the first place? There's lots of different ways to publish the work. What, what it is that made me uh, choose to, to do a book? Well, this is very personal, but one of the reasons is I like you know, holding, I'd like to have a, a product, a neatly packaged product to hold at the end of the process. I think it's, you know, there's something satisfying in that, something I can hold on to and share. Um, but it's also, uh, I think it's a great calling card. And it's a way to get my work out there. And uh, as I explained earlier, I haven't been in, you know, in this professional photo world for a long time. So for me, it's good to have a calling card that I can hand out uh, to, to you know, get press coverage and exhibit my work and so on. So it's, it's a, easier to promote the work that way. The second question that I think might come up is, why work with a the publisher? There's so many ways to publish a book these days with Blurb and uh, other um, self-publishing platforms. Why bother getting a publisher? Um, and Absolutely, there's a lot of people who self-publish these days, including some very established photographer actually decide, make the conscious decision of self-publishing. And in my case, and I might actually self-publish on my next book, I'm not exactly sure where I'll, I'll want to go from here, although it's been a very great, it's been a great experience working with Kara Verlag, um, so I might do that again. But my primary goal for this book was really to build credibility you know, from a career standpoint, and I felt like having a reputable publisher vouch for the quality of the work was an important thing. And that, that's really, that was my decision behind uh, uh, working with the publisher as opposed to self-publishing the book. Um, from a money standpoint, <laughs> for those who plan on, on making books you know, for, for, for the money part, Photo books are not a <laughs> lucrative business. Um, it's it's really uh, quite the opposite. In fact, it's it, oftentimes it ends up being a, a money pit, uh, quite literally. So, um, first of all, publishers don't cover all the costs anymore. Even the the most reputable ones, uh, you you know, the Stitle and all the the other ones will you know they, they won't tell you how much they they have the photographers uh, contribute but they all ask for some kind of contribution to the printing. And they do it in the, format, in the form in general of books that you have to buy. So there's a certain amount of books that you have to buy and you have to sell them on your own. And so you're, you're buying them for this lump sum and you're contributing that way. Um, so breaking even is actually a, a great thing, <laughs> you know, as a goal. Uh, if I break even with this project, it will be great. So it's more of an investment in my career really is, is how I see this. And uh, that's one. That's the reason I decided to launch the Kickstarter. Is you know I I, have, I will have all these books from uh, from Care when uh, when the books are available. And uh, one of the ways to make the money back is to be able to sell them myself. So um, so that's where the, those pre-orders that came out today uh, uh, will will help you know making the project happen. And it's also a great way to promote the book early. Quite frankly, you know I, I get to promote it a, a few months before the launch, which is. Uh, it's exciting and create some awareness around the work. So I'll share with you now the, the four minute Kickstarter video so you can, it will give you a little more um, background about the project. Hi, my name is Dotan Sagi. I'm a documentary photographer based in Los Angeles. You might have come across some of my work before. For the past three years, I've been documenting the culture of the Venice Beach Boardwalk. It started out as a casual street photography project, until I fell in love with the boardwalk and it turned into this exciting book project that I can't wait to share with you today. What first drew me to the Venice Boardwalk was the number of fascinating cultures. Of course there's the surfers and the skateboarders, there's so much more that very few people get to see.
What touched me the most is how inclusive and generous people are with each other on the boardwalk. I've seen homeless people giving each other food and money. I've seen little kids in the skate park spontaneously bonding with an old disabled skateboarder, curious to learn how he skates on his knees. I've seen hippies patching each other up after a crazy night of partying too hard on the boardwalk. I've seen spontaneous memorials go up for departed members of the community, some of them way too early. There's a real tenderness to it all. And sure, the heartage of the place definitely surfaces from time to time. But the boardwalk is always quickly restored to its tender, timeless state. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours looking for candid, raw moments that only happened there. And as I did, it dawned on me that this culture was actually in danger. Gentrification was accelerating. People at the center of this culture had no choice but move far away. They just couldn't afford to live there anymore. Take Jenna, for example. I originally met her and her son Jackson as they were snake-sitting for a street performer who was taking a break. It was a blissful scene out of the Garden of Eden. Now, only a year and a half later, they're fighting an eviction by their new landlord. They won't be able to afford to rent anywhere near the boardwalk. Meanwhile, companies like Snapchat are turning the boardwalk into their own corporate campus. They're pushing out small tenants like the Freak Show, which was forced to close its doors last May after many years of operation. So I felt the sense of responsibility and urgency to collect these endangered, crazy Venice moments while they were still happening. After three years and hundreds of shoots on the boardwalk, I'm finally ready to release this book. Gail Fisher did an amazing job helping me select and sequence my images for the book. Gail was a senior photo editor at National Geographic and the LA Times. Her and several of my personal heroes have endorsed this body of work by writing wonderful blurbs for the book. And with the great German publisher Kerr Verlag bringing the book to life, I already know that the printing will be fabulous. So I hope you'll join me on this journey celebrating the rich culture of the Venice Boardwalk and in the process, get your very own signed copy of the book. If you notice, the video is a, basically a slideshow with a voiceover, and I, I kind of wrestled over that because I'm not a video guy, so I was thinking either I can try to do a lousy video or try to pay somebody to do one. I was like, no, I want to do something more personal, so that's how I ended up doing the, the slideshow. Yeah, I ended up putting it together. It's just the iMovie thing, so it's not, no. <laughs> but um, it was fun. So, so anyway, the project is now on Kickstarter. Uh, if you search for Venice Beach, I'm sure you, you'll find it. Uh, there's not too many other projects about Venice Beach out there. And uh, there's some er early bird deals right now that are still on there probably. I, I checked and I think there were still some when, I, uh, when we started, so there should still be some. Um, and um, that's about it. That, that, thanks for your attention and uh, you can see my, if you want to check out my Instagram or follow me there um, and, or my website, uh, the information is right here. Thank you very much.